Living longer. Living healthier. Living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. Incorrectly using over-the-counter medications leads to thousands of hospital visits every year in the United States. That's an important reminder that when it comes to medication safety, it's not just about your prescription drugs, but everything that's in your medicine cabinet. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life, a show dedicated to helping you do just that. I'm your host, Beth Brown. Today, we're gonna to talk about everything you need to know when it comes to over-the-counter medicines. Stay with us. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. If you're like most people, you probably have a variety of over-the-counter medicines in your medicine cabinet. And while these are often safe and can provide relief for certain symptoms, they can also be dangerous when paired with other medications or other factors. Joining us this morning is pharmacist Cody Rosenbaum to talk to us about over-the-counter medications. So thanks so much for being here this morning, Cody. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's just start out by defining exactly what we're talking about here. What do we mean when we say a medicine is over-the-counter? Okay, over-the-counter medications, commonly referred to as OTC medications, are medications that can be purchased without a prescription. Uh, these are medications that the FDA has determined to be safe and effective when taken as directed on the label. Some additional considerations that apply to OTC medications include the need for them to be low uh, with mis misuse or abuse risk and that the condition is able to be self-diagnosed and treated safely and appropriately. Can you define for us, what's the difference between a medicine, a supplement, and a vitamin? Yeah, vitamins are organic compounds that the body requires in order to function normally. Vitamins are generally supplied to the body through food, but may need to be supplemented if our diet doesn't allow for enough intake. Vitamins are either classified as being fat soluble, which are easier for our bodies to store, or water soluble, which needs to be replaced more often. Vitamins are just one part of the broader term dietary supplement. Uh, dietary supplements also include things like minerals, amino acids, enzymes, and herbs. The FDA doesn't require dietary supplements to be proven safe and does not allow manufacturers to market dietary supplements as treatment or cure for specific diseases. This makes it important to talk with a healthcare provider uh, before taking dietary supplements to make sure they're safe and appropriate on an individual basis. That's Lastly, over-the-counter medicines are substances regulated by the FDA that have been proven safe and effective when taken according to the label. This allows manufacturers to market these products as approved treatments for specific conditions and to provide specific instructions on how to use them. Okay, great. And so how do I know what's in my medicine or in my supplement? The FDA has specific label requirements for both medications and supplements that are different. Supplements are legally required to be labeled as a dietary supplement and must include the name of the dietary supplement along with how much of the supplement is in a dose. Manufacturers of dietary supplements also have to include the ingredient list and nutrition labeling. Medications are also required to list ingredients on the label, which are divided into active ingredients and inactive ingredients. And so that was actually going to be my next question. I know they can be divided often. Do I need to pay attention to both, or is one more important than the other? Yeah, both lists of ingredients are important to pay attention to. The active ingredient in the medication is the part of the medication that's intended to cause a pharmacological effect on the body and is used to treat the appropriate condition. There can be more than one active ingredient in OTC medications, which is especially important if multiple products are being used at a time that contain the same active ingredients. An example of this is the addition of acetaminophen to medications used for treating a range of conditions where it's important to make sure that toxicity doesn't occur from taking too much. Uh, the inactive ingredients list includes anything else included in the medication that's not intended to provide any effect. Examples of these include flavoring, dyes for color, or the base that the active ingredient was added to in order to aid in delivery or application of the medication. One of the main reasons to look at inactive ingredients is to make sure the medication doesn't include something that the person's allergic to or something that needs to be considered with the patient's condition like sugar and diabetes, for example. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of reading labels? What else can a person learn besides ingredients? Yeah, understanding what ingredients in a medication are in there is only a part of the value of reading the label. The label can tell you what the medication is used for, who should and who should not use it, how to use it, what uh, adverse effects to look out for, or when to stop taking the medication. If I'm concerned about an over-the-counter medication, where else can I look to get information about it? 
The best solution for more information or questions about a specific over-the-counter medication would be probably to talk with your pharmacist or healthcare provider. Uh, these professionals are good resources to make sure that OTC medications in question don't interact significantly with any other medications you're taking and can give you more information or warnings based on any specific conditions you might have. Would you say that some over-the-counter medicines can uh, pose more of a risk than other over-the-counter medicines? That's a tough one to answer. Most over-the-counter medications pose a certain amount of risk due to the fact that they are capable of and intended to produce an effect on the body. This risk becomes greater when the labels are not read and followed for sure. The medicine should only be used for an indicated condition by a person that's not contraindicated to use it and who's aware of all the warnings at the recommended dose and time intervals and for only the length of time allowed by the label. If followed, these requirements can help protect people from medications that have risks of toxicity, excessive dosages like acetaminophen or from potential harm like stomach tissue damage caused by NSAIDs or from failure to follow warnings like performing dangerous tasks while experiencing drowsiness from medications like diphenhydramine. Can age play a role when it comes to possible risks? Age does have a significant role for OTC medications. Typically, the most susceptible uh, people are to age-related risks are the very young and the elderly. It's important to pay attention to labeling that addresses usage in certain age groups. Dose recommendations may be different depending on age, or the medication might be contraindicated altogether. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about folks who might be living with certain health issues or conditions. Can they be at greater risks for certain over-the-counter medications? Additional health con conditions can definitely increase certain risks and should always be considered when taking an over-the-counter medication. All OTC medications will have appropriate warning labeling that includes directions to avoid use if the medication is known to have an increased risk with a particular condition. Uh, common conditions that can result in increased risk include people with high blood pressure who should be careful with medications like decongestants, NSAID pain medications, or medications high in sodium. People with diabetes should be careful with medications that can increase uh, blood glucose levels, such as decongestants again, or medications that contain sugar, like many liquid medications. And then women who are pregnant should also pay very close attention to warnings on over-the-counter medicine labels. Okay, that's good advice. So we're all different. We all live with our own issues and health problems. How do I really know if an over-the-counter medicine is safe for me to take? The FDA's requirements for over-the-counter medication labeling is very thorough and a complete review of the label is the first place to start. If there's no listed contraindication that applies to you or a medication you're already taking, then using the medication as instructed should be safe as long as the warnings and the situations when the medication should be stopped are understood. However, there, if there's ever concern when considering adding an over-the-counter medication, it's a good idea to ask your pharmacist or healthcare provider to weigh all the factors and uh, see if it's right for you. Okay, great. Cody, thanks so much. We do need to pause here and take a break. But when we come back, we're going to talk about some common side effects when it comes to over-the-counter medications and how to know if a pain reliever, pain reliever is the right one to be taking. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back. I'm still talking with Cody Rosenbaum, a pharmacist from St. Peter's Health. And now, Cody, I'd like to talk a little bit about side effects and some of the adverse uh, um, reactions that folks can potentially have from over-the-counter medicines. So when we talk about side effects, what exactly can that entail? And are side effects always bad? Yeah, side effects are any effects from the medication other than the intended effect. Side effects aren't always dangerous, but it's always important to be aware of the possible side effects with the medication. In some cases, a medication may have an effect that's considered a side effect when being used for a certain treatment, but the same side effect may be the intended treatment for a different condition. An example of this is with use of certain antihistamines like diphenhydramine. Uh, as an allergy product, it's known to cause a side effect of drowsiness. However, it can also be labeled as a sleep aid where the effect of drowsiness is the intended effect. And people might hear the term drug-to-drug -drug interaction. Can you talk about what that means and different types of interactions and how they happen? Yeah. Medications can interact with other medications, both prescription and over-the-counter, in several ways. Uh, one way that they can interact is by adding to another drug's effect by duplication. This can happen when you're taking more than one of the same type of medication or taking multiple medications with the same side effect. Uh, like a scene when taking more than one medication with a sedative effect, for example. 
Another way medications can interact is if two medications have opposite effects that block out the action of each other. An example of this would be taking a decongestant like pseudoephedrine with certain medications that are used to treat high blood pressure, which could result in an elevated blood pressure. Uh, a third and more complicated way that medications can interact is by changing the way the body responds to another medication. Medications can change how much of another medication is absorbed into the body, can change how the body metabolizes another medication, and can change how fast the body is able to eliminate another medication. Are there the same concerns when it comes to supplements and vitamins? Can they cause drug-to-drug -drug interactions? Yes, virtually anything that has any effect on the body has the potential to interact with other substances. So supplements and vitamins are included in possible drug-drug interactions. Let's talk a little bit about drug and food interactions. Are there certain things you could eat that might cause issues with an over-the-counter medicine? Yes, drug and food interactions happen and can be significant. Food can interact with medications by all the same mechanisms that I described with the drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Grapefruit juice is one food that's known to interact with a number of medications, including over-the-counter medications. An example of this is with the allergy medication fexofenadine. Um, dairy products that are high in calcium can bind to certain medications and reduce their absorption, like iron supplements or even certain antibiotics. And let's talk about allergic reactions, another potential side effect. How can a person know if he or she is allergic to either the medicine or something that's in the medicine? Allergic reactions are an important side effect that can happen with any over-the-counter medicine. Uh, it's important to keep track of any known allergies and make sure that any over-the-counter product you take doesn't have that ingredient in it. Known allergies can also help predict the risk of allergy to other ingredients that might be similar. So it's important to pr provide any list um, of known allergy information to any healthcare workers you interact with. In most cases, a person won't know they're allergic to something until they experience a reaction while taking it, however. Uh, this means it's important for anyone who is taking uh, something new to be aware of the possible signs of an allergic reaction. Some of these might include uh, itching, rash, swelling, hives, shortness of breath, wheezing, and even anaphylaxis. Allergies aren't only possible with the first dose of a new medication, but they can also happen after repeated exposure in certain cases. Let's switch topics a little bit and talk about questions people can ask either a doctor or a pharmacist when it comes to over-the-counter over medications that they're taking. What kind of questions should they be asking? Yeah, really any question the person has should be asked in order to help reduce the risk of reaction and to help increase the understanding of the medication. Uh, if any severe allergies are known, it's a good idea to make sure that the doctor or pharmacist is aware uh, by asking if the OTC medication is okay to take with your allergy. It's also a good idea to ask if there's any concerns when taking an OTC medication with any conditions you're unsure of how the medication might interact, or if you're known to be more sensitive to any specific side effects. Can we talk specifically about over-the-counter pain medications? So there are typically two types. Can you talk about those and what they are? Yeah, there's acetaminophen and NSAIDs, which is short for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They're both types of pain medications available without a prescription. Acetaminophen is also known as Tylenol, useful for pain, fever. NSAIDs are a class of, medi class of medi medication that includes several over-the-counter medications like ibuprofen, uh, known as Advil or Motrin, uh, naproxen, known as Aleve, or aspirin, known as Bayer. And over-the-counter NSAIDs are typically useful for treating pain, inflammation, fever, and menstrual aches. Okay, and so you touched on this, but when should a person take an NSAID versus when should a person take an acetaminophen? That's a good question. Both acetaminophen and NSAIDs are useful for a number of conditions and have some crossover where either option could be chosen. It might even be useful to take a combination of the two, like we find in uh, some Excedrin products for migraine. Uh, if a person needs to treat symptoms related to inflammation or painful menstrual cramps, then an NSAID would be more appropriate. Uh, both acetaminophen and NSAIDs are useful for mild to moderate pain, headache, fever. Uh, in some cases, when treating pain, it might just come down to personal experience and preference. Uh, but choosing between acetaminophen and NSAIDs can also come down to their unique risks and factors that are specific to the individual. And so you mentioned risks. Can you talk about those? Yeah. Acetaminophen is well tolerated in the absence of any allergy or drug interactions. Typically, our main concern is the risk of liver damage. Um, this can occur when high doses of acetaminophen are taken or for people who already have existing liver damage or who drink alcohol. Uh, NSAIDs have more risks that require consideration. NSAIDs can increase risk of bleeding, especially in the stomach or intestines. Uh, the risk of these bleeds is even higher when you're taking other medications with an increased risk of bleeding. Uh, or for people who drink alcohol or who have long-term use of NSAIDs. 
NSAIDs other than aspirin can actually increase the risk of heart attack, stroke, and heart failure. So they should be avoided in people with a history of these or related conditions like uh, high blood pressure. There's also an increased risk of liver or kidney damage when people take these with existing liver or kidney disease. Okay, we just have a couple seconds left. Any final thoughts you want folks to know about over-the-counter pain meds? Yeah, it's important for people to understand that over-the-counter pain medications should only be used for minor pain and for short periods of time. If the pain is unresolved after being treated with them, or if they're needed on a longer term basis, then a discussion should be had with your doctor. Thank you very much. Okay, we do need to pause for another break, but coming up, we're going to talk about some of the benefits of over-the-counter medicines and how to properly store them. Don't go away. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back. Cody Rosenbaum is still with us and we're talking about over-the-counter medications. And so let's just switch gears here a little bit and we're not trying to give over-the-counter medicines a bad name or anything. Can you talk about some of the benefits and when it's right to take an over-the-counter medicine? Yeah, over-the-counter medications are an important and valuable part of wellness and self-care. Having access to medications that can be safely and effectively used without a prescription can help reduce cost and reduce the delay in starting treatment for more uncomplicated conditions. What's your advice for somebody who regularly takes an over-the-counter medication? Are they safe to use long-term? The need for long-term or repeated use of over-the-counter medications may warrant a discussion with your doctor. Uh, it might be a sign of a more serious condition or that over-the-counter medications just aren't the right choice for a particular situation. Uh, additionally, long-term use of any medication might have a higher risk uh, or require a more comprehensive view of a person's full medical picture. Can you talk about when it's most important to make sure that a person sits down and talks with either his or her doctor or a pharmacist about the over-the-counter medicines he or she is taking? Yeah, it's more important to uh, talk to a pharmacist or doctor about a new or continued use of an over-the-counter medication if there's multiple health conditions or multiple medications to be considered. It can get complicated. Uh, it's also important to talk to a pharmacist or doctor if the condition doesn't improve or if any of the warnings on the label apply to you. Let's switch topics and talk about storing medications. Tips there for safely storing them. Uh, yeah, medication labeling will have any necessary information about storage requirements specific to the OTC medication in question. However, there are general recommendations that apply to most medications. Uh, you should keep medication in its original container so that the expiration information stays accurate and available, uh, along with all directions and other pertinent information. Medication should also be stored out of reach of children and in a cool, dry place. And you did just mention expiration dates, and we know those are often on the bottles. How does a person know if a medicine has gone bad? Yeah, medication just shouldn't be used if it's past the labeled expiration date or if it's been stored in a way that's different than stated on the label. Also, if there's a change in the medication's appearance, it should be discarded. Uh, this could be seen, for example, with a liquid medication that changes color or becomes cloudy. Are there certain conditions or environments maybe that would make a medication go bad before the expiration date? Yes, medications may go bad or have an earlier expiration date in certain conditions or environments. Some medications must be discarded once they're used, like single-use medications, or they might even have a shortened expiration range once they're opened. Also, if the storage instructions aren't followed, like mentioned, um, for example, the required temperature range, then the me medication should be discarded. And I know I'm probably not alone here. I often keep one of those little travel bottles of Advil or Tylenol or something in my purse or in my car. Is that bad? Does that make them go bad fast or anything like that? Yeah, it's not a good idea to store medication in a car because the temperature can fluctuate too much and it can easily go outside of the labeled temperature range. Uh, this can cause the medication to change or to lose potency. And if a medication needs to be kept close, then storing it in a purse would be the better of the two solutions, as long as you can keep it with you and in the correct temperature range. Uh, if this option is used, though, it's important to consider if there's a risk of children accessing the medication sure. and being sure to responsibly store it out of reach when you're setting the purse down. Okay. So if a medicine does go bad or it's hit ex ex expiration date, how do you get rid of it properly? Can you talk about disposal steps people should take? Sure. Getting rid of expired or ruined medications is important to prevent them from being accidentally taken by you or someone else. Uh, it's not recommended to flush them down the toilet. Instead, they should be thrown away in the trash in a way that makes them unusable. 
Uh, some ways to do that include mixing them with coffee grounds, cat litter, or something else undesirable, and then putting the mixture into a sealed container. Another great option is taking medications to a drug take back location. And let's talk about those actually. What is a drug take back program and how can someone find one in his or her community? Yeah, here in Montana, the Department of Justice has coordinated with local law enforcement and the DEA to hold statewide drug take back days uh, where medications are collected and then properly destroyed. Uh, there's also permanent drug take back containers that are located across the state and the locations of these can be found at the website for the Montana Department of Justice. And I would imagine other states probably have similar websites that they could just go out and try to find something like that. I would imagine so. Okay, and so we have about a minute and a half here left, Cody. So um, let's talk about any closing thoughts or final words of advice you would really like to hit home with folks about over-the-counter medicines. Okay. Yeah. Um, Over-the-counter medications are very useful and they can be safely used. They should be treated the same as prescription medications in that the instructions must be closely followed and they should be stored and disposed of properly uh, and safely. It's also good to remember to not be afraid to use your available resources and ask any questions you have to your doctor or your pharmacist if there's any doubt. Okay, great. Very good advice. Thank you so much, Cody, for being on with us this morning. We appreciate your time and your expertise. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much for tuning in and watching this morning. We hope you'll remember to come back and watch us again next weekend. Until then, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Have a great week. Thanks, everybody. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health in partnership with AARP Montana. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the Healthy Living for Life logo. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.